Hello everyone, this is Doc Ina and the topic for today is on abnormal labor. To download my lecture deck, please visit my WordPress site. This is the main reference for our lecture. It's Williams Obstetrics 24th edition, chapter 23, Abnormal Labor. This is the outline of our lecture for today. So to be able to understand what is abnormal labor, we must first do a quick review of the basic concepts of normal labor. So basically, labor is divided into three stages. The first stage is from the onset of regular contractions up to full cervical dilatation. The second stage is from full cervical dilatation up to the delivery of the fetus. The third stage is from the delivery of the fetus to the delivery of the placenta. There is also what we call the fourth stage, which is one hour from the delivery of the placenta. So the typical labor curve or the typical normal labor curve is a sigmoid shape. It is divided into the latent phase and the active phase. The active phase is divided into three phases, the acceleration phase, the phase of maximum slope, and the deceleration phase. We have also the three functional divisions of labor. The preparatory division, which encompasses the latent phase and the acceleration phase. Although cervix dilates little during this division, the connective tissue of the cervix changes considerably during this stage. Sedation and conduction analgesia are capable of arresting this division. The second division is the dilatation division. Dilatation proceeds at its most rapid rate during this division, and this division is unaffected by sedation. The third division is the pelvic division, which encompasses the deceleration phase and the second stage of labor. This also commences with the deceleration phase, and this is where the cardinal fetal movements take place. So when doing a labor curve for a patient in labor, we have to remember that there is a y-axis and an x-axis. So here, in this picture, the x-axis is the time or the number of hours of labor of the patient. The left side y-axis represents the dilatation or the cervical dilatation, which we will number from 0 to 10. The right side y-axis will be the fetal descent or the fetal station, which we will number as negative 5 to plus 5. So let us also review the concept of asyncletism. Normal syncletism is when the fetal sagittal suture is midway between the symphysis pubis and the sacral promontory. Anterior asyncletism is when the sagittal suture of the fetus points more towards the sacral promontory and therefore the anterior parietal bone of the fetus is presenting at the birth canal. Posterior parietal asyncletism or posterior asyncletism happens when the sagittal suture of the fetus points more towards the symphysis pubis and therefore the posterior parietal bone is presenting at the birth canal. Asyncletism can lead to abnormal labor. So what is abnormal labor? Abnormal labor is also called or termed dystocia, which literally means difficult labor or dysfunctional labor or abnormally slow labor progress. It, also, it is also termed as cephalopelvic disproportion or CPD or failure to progress. It arises from three distinct abnormalities or what we call the three piece of dystocia that may exist singly or in combination. The three piece of dystocia are power, passenger, and passages. Power refers to maternal expulsive forces, which, which may be abnormal. It may be inadequate uterine contractions or inadequate voluntary maternal muscle effort during the second stage of labor. The, the second P is the passenger, which refers to fetal abnormalities of presentation or an, an abnormal position of the fetus, which may also be a singletism that can also slow labor. The third P is passages, which refer to abnormalities of the maternal bony pelvis, which may create a contracted pelvis, or soft tissue abnormalities of the reproductive tract, which may form an obstacle to fetal descent. 
Here are some of the common clinical findings in women with ineffective labor. First is due to inadequate cervical dilatation or fetal descent, which may be in the form of a protracted labor, arrested labor, or inadequate expulsive effort by the mother. Second is fetopelvic disproportion, secondary to excessive fetal size, inadequate pelvic capacity or malpresentation or position of the fetus. And the third is ruptured membranes without labor. One of the basic requirements before we diagnose dystocia is that the uterine contractions must be adequate. And for us to say that uterine contractions are adequate, it must first achieve at least 200 Montevideo units. So how do we determine the number of Montevideo units? So first, we must obtain an intrapartal tracing or a fetal tracing. So in this case, we have an intrapartal tracing of 10 minutes. So at the top part is the fetal heart rate and at the bottom part are the uterine contractions. So let us focus on the uterine contractions. To be able to compute for the number of Montevideo units, you must first um, count the number of contractions. In this case, we have four uterine contractions. So in this first uterine contraction, which is labeled as 1, look at the peak uterine contraction. So that is about 65 millimeter Hg. And then subtract that from the baseline uterine contraction, which is around 10 millimeter Hg. So the difference of that, 65 minus 10, is 55 millimeter Hg pressure. That's for contraction number one. Let's go to contraction number two. So this is 60 or 65 minus 15. The third contraction is 60 minus 10. So that's 50 millimeter Hg difference. And the fourth contraction is around 50 or 55 minus 10 millimeter Hg. So that's about 45 millimeter Hg. So you add all the pressure, the net pressure for all four contractions. So that's 55 plus 50 plus 50 plus 45 equals 200 Montevideo units. So this intrapartal tracing, we have adequate uterine contractions because it registered at least 200 Montevideo units. So these are the three basic abnormal labor patterns. We have the prolongation disorder, protraction disorder, and the arrest disorder. Prolongation disorder is an abnormal la labor pattern during the latent phase, while protraction disorder and arrest disorder are abnormal la labor patterns during the active phase. So under prolongation disorder, we only have one type, which is prolonged latent phase. For nuliparas, the diagnostic criterion should be more than 20 hours. And for multiparas, the diagnostic criterion should be more than 14 hours. The preferred treatment for a prolongation disorder is bed rest. For protraction disorders, we have two types, the protracted active phase dilatation and the protracted descent. For protracted active phase dilatation, the, the diagnostic criterion for that is less than 1.2 cm per hour for nulipara and less than 1.5 cm per, per hour for multiparas. For protracted descent, the, di the diagnostic criterion should be less than 1 cm per hour for nuliparas and less than 2 cm per hour for multiparas. The preferred treatment for protraction disorders is expectant and support, although we can also do cesarean delivery in cases of cephalopelvic disproportion. The last uh, abnormal labor pattern is arrest disorder, and we have four types under this disorder. We have the prolonged deceleration phase. The diagnostic criterion is greater than three hours for nuliparas or greater than an hour for multiparas. The secondary arrest of dilatation, 
greater than 2 hours for nuliparas and greater than 2 hours also for multiparas. For a rest of descent, the diagnostic criterion is uh, greater than an hour for bo both nuliparas and multiparas. And for failure of descent, it's no descent in the during the deceleration phase or second stage. The preferred treatment for arrest disorders is cesarean delivery. So here are some examples of the typical abnormal labor patterns and how they look like when we plot them in a graph. So in this case, we are showing you the y-axis which is labeled as cervical dilatation. This is the left side y-axis and you can see here that it is labeled from 0 to 10. The right side y-axis is the fetal station which is labeled negative 5 to plus 5. And then the x-axis here is the number of hours of labor. So let us um, point out some of the abnormal labor patterns shown in this graph. The first one is prolonged latent phase. This is prolonged latent phase because as you can see, it has never reached the active phase. And you see that at least, this is at least, um, what, more than 20 hours of uh, latent phase and that's why it's called prolonged latent phase. Second is protracted active phase of dilatation. See, in this graph, uh, this represents cervical dilatation because you see that every plot is a circle. So those that um, plotting fetal station, it that is represented by an X. So this second labor pattern is a protracted active phase of dilatation. The third uh, abnormal labor pattern is protracted descent. Another is failure of descent because as you can see here, the labor curve didn't even reach station zero. And the last is arrest of descent because you see that it has surpassed station zero, but the descent did not progress beyond station plus one. Again, some more examples of abnormal labor patterns. Number one here is the prolonged latent phase. Two is the protracted active phase of dilatation. The third pattern is the protracted descent. Fourth pattern is prolonged deceleration phase. The fifth is secondary arrest of dilatation. Number six is arrest of descent. And number seven is failure of descent. So let us now discuss the mechanism of dystocia for the first stage of labor. The fetal head must encounter a re relatively thick lower uterine segment and undilated cervix. And so uterine contraction, cervical resistance, and the forward pressure exerted by the leading fetal part are the factors influencing the progress of first stage of labor. For the second stage of labor, after complete cervical dilatation, the mechanical relationship between the fetal head size and position and the pelvic capacity, namely fetopelvic proportion, becomes clearer as the fetus descends. And because of this, abnormalities in fetopelvic proportions become more apparent once the second stage is reached. This is the muller helis maneuver, which is exerting manual pressure on the fundus while the other finger is inserted in the vagina which determines the descent of the head into the pelvis while the manual pressure is being exerted. They say that failure of the descent of the head into the pelvis while doing the muller helis maneuver is indicative of dystocia. For the abnormalities of the expulsive forces, we have two types of uterine dysfunction. There is hypotonic uterine dysfunction where no basal hypertonus and uterine contractions have a normal gradient pattern but pressure during a contraction is insufficient to dilate the cervix. The hypertonic uterine dysfunction on the other hand is also called incoordinate uterine dysfunction where either the basal tone is elevated appreciably or the gra pressure gradient is distorted. Gradient distortion may result from 
more forceful contraction of the uterine mid-segment than the fundus or from a complete asynchrony of the impulses originating in each cornu or a combination of these two. For the active phase disorder, we have labor abnormalities that are divided into either protraction disorder, which is also which also means lower than normal progress of labor, and an arrest disorder, which is complete cessation of progress. A woman must be in the active phase of labor with cervical dilatation of at least three to four centimeters to be diagnosed with either of these. The ACOG or the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has suggested that before the diagnosis of first stage labor arrest is made, specific criteria should be met, one of which is that the latent phase has been completed and that the cervix is dilated 4 cm or more. In other words, the labor has uh, entered the active phase. The second uh, requirement is that the uterine contraction pattern of 200 Montevideo units or more in a 10-minute period has been present for 2 hours without cervical change. What are the reported causes of uterine dysfunction or powers? One is epidural anesthesia. Epidural anesthesia can slow down labor. This is associated with lengthening of the both the first and the second stage of labor and with slowing of the rate of fetal descent. Infection in the form of chorioamunitis can also cause uterine dysfunction. Infection diagnosed late in labor is found to be a marker of cesarean delivery performed for dystocia, whereas this was not a marker in women diagnosed as having chorioamunitis early in labor. Number three is maternal position during labor. According to Miller, the uterus contracts more frequently but with less intensity when the mother lying on her back with the mother lying on her back rather than on her side. Conversely, contraction frequency and intensity have been reported to increase with sitting or standing. Lupe and Gross, however, uh, said that there is no conclusive evidence that upright maternal posture or ambulation improves labor. So we are done with the powers. We now go to the second P, which represents passages. Fetal pelvic disproportion arises from diminished pelvic capacity, excessive fetal size, or more usually both. There may be a contraction of the pelvic inlet, the mid-pelvis, or the pelvic outlet, or a generally contracted pelvis may be caused by combinations of these. First, let us discuss the contracted inlet. The pelvic inlet usually is considered to be contracted if its shortest anterior posterior diameter is less than 10 or if the greatest transverse diameter is less than 12. But usually, it is more convenient to diagnose contracted inlet when the diagonal conjugate is less than 11.5 cm. In a contracted pelvis, the entire force exerted by the uterus acts directly on the portion of membranes that contact the dilating cervix. Early spontaneous rupture of the membranes is more likely. After membrane rupture, absent pressure by the head against the cervix and the lower uterine segment predisposes to less effective contractions. Dilatation may proceed very slowly or sometimes not at all. In women with contracted pelvis, the face and shoulder presentations are encountered three to, three to four times more frequently and the cord prolapses four to six times more often. Second is a contracted midplane or the midpelvis. This is the, actually the most common type of uh, contraction. This causes transverse arrest of the fetal head which potentially can lead to a difficult mid-forceps operation or cesarean delivery. The mid-pelvis is contracted when the interspenous diameter is less than 8 cm or the sum of the interspenous and posterior sagittal diameter of the mid-pelvis is 13.5 cm or less.
The third is contracted outlet. And we diagnose this when the interischial tuberous diameter is 8 cm or less. A contracted outlet may cause dystocia not so much by itself, but by an often associated mid-pelvic contraction. Outlet contraction without concomitant mid-pain contraction is rare. Contracted outlet often gives rise to perineal tears. So, the last P is passenger. First is face presentation. When a fetus is in face presentation, we rarely can deliver this vaginally. In a face presentation, the head is hyperextended so that the occiput is in contact with the fetal back and the mentum or the chin is presenting. So let's review. This is a, obviously, this is a face presentation. So this first picture represents right mentum posterior. The second picture is right mentum transverse. The third picture is right mentum anterior. And the last picture or the fourth picture is mentum anterior. What is the etiology of a face presentation? This include conditions that favor extension or prevent head flexion. These are preterm infants with their smaller head dimensions can engage before conversion to vertex position. Also, marked enlargement of the neck or coils of cord around the neck may also cause extension. Also included are fetal malformations and hydramnios, anencephalic fetuses, Feet, uh, pelvis is contracted or the fetus is very large or if the mother is of high parity. How do we manage face presentation? Usually, cesarean delivery is indicated. Second presentation that, um, may, cause present, that may cause dystocia is brow presentation. This is diagnosed when that portion of the fetal head between the orbital ridge and the anterior fontanelle presents at the pelvic inlet. The fetal head occupies a position midway between the full flexion and extension. Engagement of the fetal head and subsequent delivery cannot take place as long as the brow presentation persists. The third is when the fetus is in transverse lie. Now, the long axis of the fetus when in transverse lie is approximately perpendicular to the lie or to the axis of the mother. The shoulder is usually positioned over the pelvic inlet. So the head occupies one iliac fossa and the breech on the other. What is the etiology of transverse lie? Common causes are the following. Abdominal wall relaxation because of very high parity of the mother. Preterm fetus, placenta previa, abnormal uterine anatomy, hydramnios, or a contracted pelvis. Next is a neglected transverse lie. After rupture of the membranes, the fetal shoulder is forced into the pelvis and the arm prolapses. The shoulder then is arrested by the margins of the pelvic inlet with the head in one iliac fossa and the breech on the other. The uterus contracts vigorously in an unsuccessful attempt to overcome the obstacle. With time, a retraction ring rises increasingly higher and becomes more marked. With this neglected transverse lie, the uterus will eventually rupture. This um, retraction ring is also called the retraction ring of Bandel. And when you see this clinically, this is an ominous sign that the uterus might or will eventually rupture. So how do we manage transverse lie? We usually do cesarean delivery when the fetus is in transverse lie, but sometimes before labor or early in labor with the membranes intact, attempts at external version are worthwhile in the absence of other complications. So another fetal presentation that may potentially cause dystocia is compound presentation. In a compound presentation, an extremity prolapses alongside the presenting part of the fetus and both present simul simultaneously in the pelvis. Causes of compound presentations are conditions that 
prevent complete occlusion of the pelvic inlet by the fetal head, and this includes preterm labor. How do we manage compound presentation? In most cases, the prolapse part should be left alone because most often, it will not interfere with labor. Now, if the arm is prolapsed alongside the head, the condition should be observed closely to ascertain whether the arm retracts out of the way with descent of the presenting part. If it fails to retract, and if it appears to prevent descent of the head, the prolapse arm should be pushed gently upward and the head simultaneously downward by fundal pressure. In general, rates of perinatal mortality and morbidity are increased as a result of concomitant preterm delivery, prolapse cord, and traumatic obstetrical procedures. That is the reason why most ob gynecologists opt to do cesarean delivery for fetuses in compound presentation. What are some of the complications associated with dystocia? We have maternal complications and the fetal complications. Let's first discuss the maternal complications with dystocia. First is, and the most important is, uterine rupture. This is abnormal thinning of the lower uterine segment during prolonged labor. This is often seen in patients of high parity and in those with prior cesarean delivery. So when this proportion is so pronounced that there is no engagement or descent, the lower uterine segment becomes increasingly stretched and rupture may follow. So in uterine rupture, we usually see here the pathological retraction ring of Bandel, and this is associated with marked stretching and thinning of the lower uterine segment. Earlier, you saw this uh, retraction ring of Bandel or the pathological re retraction ring of Bandel in a neglected transverse lie. The ring may be seen clearly as a uterine indentation and signifies impending rupture of the lower uterine segment. That's why I told you earlier that this is an ominous sign, an impending sign of a, a, more, a major morbidity, which is a rupture of the uterus. Another complication or maternal complication associated with dystocia is fistula formation. So with dystocia, the soft tissues of the birth canal lying between the leading part and the pelvic wall may be subjected to very, 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 very high pressure or excessive pressure. And because of impaired circulation of these soft tissues, necrosis may result and become evident several days after delivery as vesicovaginal, vesicocervical, or rectovaginal fistulas. Another complication is pelvic floor injury. So during childbirth, the pelvic floor is exposed to direct compression by, uh, from the fetal head and to downward pressure from maternal expulsive efforts. These forces stretch and distend the pelvic floor, resulting in functional and anatomical alterations in the muscles, nerves, and connective tissues thus leading to urinary incontinence and to pelvic organ prolapse. There's also postpartum lower extremity nerve injury, and the most common mechanism is external compression of the common fibular or the common peroneal nerve, usually caused by inappropriate leg positioning in stirrups, especially during prolonged second stage of labor. Fortunately, symptoms resolve within six months of delivery for most women. So the second category of complications associated with dystocia are the perinatal complications, which include the following, caput succedaneum or the swelling or edema of the fetal scalp, molding, which is or leads to abnormal head shape, or mechanical trauma such as nerve injury, fractures, and cephalohematoma. So basically, we've discussed dystocia as abnormal labor, or abnormally slow labor. So on the other hand, or the other extreme, we also have what we call precipitous labor and delivery. Precipitous labor and delivery is extremely rapid labor and delivery. It may result from an abnormally low resistance of the soft parts of the birth canal, from abnormally strong uterine and abdominal contractions, or rarely from the absence of painful sensations and thus a lack of awareness of vigorous labor. Usually, precipitous labor terminates in expulsion of the fetus in less than 3 hours of labor. 
What are the maternal effects of precipitous labor and delivery? Vigorous uterine contractions combined with a long, firm cervix in a non-compliant birth canal may lead to uterine rupture or extensive lacerations of the cervix, vagina, vulva, or perineum. It is in these latter circumstances that the rare condition of amniotic fluid embolism most likely develops. Precipitous labor is frequently followed by uterine atony, where the uterus that contracts with unusual vigor before delivery is likely to be hypotonic after delivery and then leads to postpartum hemorrhage, which is a major mor- cause of maternal morbidity or even maternal mortality. Short labor, which is uh, defined as a rate of cervical dilatation of 5 cm per hour or faster for nulliparas and 10 cm per hour for multiparas, is associated with placental abruptio, meconium, staining, postpartum hemorrhage, cocaine abuse, and low Apgar scores. Tumultuous uterine contractions prevent appropriate uterine blood flow and fetal oxygenation. And therefore, this could also lead, lead to herb or Duchenne brachial palsy associated with such tumultuous uterine contractions. And during an unattended birth, the newborn may fall to the floor and be injured, or it may need resuscitation that is not immediately available. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe to my channels my YouTube channel, and my WordPress site, Tokina Obigaine. Thank you!